why I think it exists and why I think we therefore can't ignore it. Uh, but briefly, I want to say a few things about just what I think our, our situation in the world is, because I really think religion is leading us to the edge of something terrible. Uh, and I think if you look at, if you read the news, if you, if you watch the news, you, you see that much of the world is over the edge already. 53% of the U.S. population believes that the universe is 6,000 years old and that we have no genetic precursors in the natural world apart from Adam and Eve. Uh, there was a, a study done in 34 countries uh, assessing the, the level of belief in evolution, and, and the U.S. came in 33rd just before Turkey. This is embarrassing. Uh, but when you add to this, this comedy of false certainties the, the fact that 44% of Americans claim to be confident that Jesus is going to return to earth in their lifetime, uh, you see a, a terrible liability of this kind of thinking because when you, when you look at the, the prophecies uh, that, that describe these end of times events, uh, you see that it's not an exaggeration to say that something like half of the American population is eagerly anticipating the end of the world. Uh, I think it should be rather obvious that this kind of thinking provides people with no basis to, to make the hard decisions we have to make to create a durable civilization for ourselves, to make, to make geopolitical and environmental and economic policy that has a time horizon of not 50 years, but thousands of years. Now, Many of these people are lunatics, of course, but they are not the lunatic fringe. I mean, we're talking about people who can get Karl Rove on the telephone on a weekly basis, uh, and do on a weekly basis. We're talking about Christian ministers who have congregations numbering in the tens of thousands. We're talking about organizations that have operating budgets in the tens of millions of dollars a year, and in some cases, hundreds of millions of dollars a year whose primary purpose is to spread this ghoulish expectation that the world is soon going to end in glory. We're talking about a group like uh, the Christians United for Israel, which is lobbying the White House and Congress at this moment to take a very hard line with Iran for <laughs> biblical reasons. Now, it may be that we want to take a very hard line with Iran, but it seems to me uh, rather obvious that we don't want our religious maniacs pushing us there. Uh, we're talking about grown men and women with immense political influence who literally believe that, that a confrontation of this sort would be a fulfillment of biblical prophecy and they expect to be raptured into the sky by Jesus so that they can watch the rest of us hurled into a sea of fire. And yet if you can imagine it, the picture is actually much bleaker in the Muslim world. We are, we are meandering into a global conflict with 1.3, 1.4 billion Muslims, a significant percentage of whom view every political and moral question through the lens of Islam, through, in terms of their affiliation with Islam, which is to say they will side with other Muslims no matter how sociopathic their behavior simply because there are other Muslims in, in conflict with non-Muslims. Now, there are many well-intentioned people in our society who feel an impulse to apologize for all, all of this, who, who think that all of the bloodletting we're witnessing in the Muslim world is a result of the, the militarism and the incompetence and the greed of our own government. Now, I, I'm convinced this is a profoundly dangerous misunderstanding of our situation for reasons that I, I spell out at some length in my first book, The End of Faith. Uh, and I'm convinced it's a misunderstanding even if we admit that our war in Iraq has been a catastrophic mistake, as I think it has been. I mean, w there's no question we have made enemies in Iraq, but there are enemies there that we have not made or not merely made. And, there are, and, and the enemies we have made, for the most part, we have made by virtue of their theology. By, by, by virtue of what they believe about the ascendancy of their faith and the, uh, uh, the one true way uh, to live on this earth. So this is the situation I think we're in. I think faith is playing both sides of the board in a, an increasingly dangerous game. 
And the greatest problem with the rest of us, with, with secularists and religious moderates and scientists, is that we find it very difficult to believe that people actually believe this stuff. So, secularists and, and religious moderates almost by definition don't know what it's like to be certain of God, to be certain of paradise, to be certain that the book they keep by their bed is the perfect word of the creator of the universe. And therefore they tend to discount the utterances of, of people who really are certain as propaganda, as, as, as behavior that's, that's really a cover for, for behavior that's being motivated by economics and politics. I don't know how many more engineers and architects need to fly planes into our buildings before we realize that this is not merely a matter of lack of education or, econ or economic despair. So I, let me speak for a few minutes about how I view the responsibility of, of uh, science here. It seems to me that the responsibility of science and public intellectuals generally is to be honest. Because this really is a problem of discourse. This is a problem of ideas being systematically sheltered from criticism. So one truth, I think, in need of telling is this, that there really is a conflict between religion and science, between faith and reason. Because every religion is making claims about the way the world is. These are claims about the divine origin of certain books, about the virgin birth of certain people, about the survival of the human personality after death. These, are, these claims purport to be about reality. They are claims about what was and what is and what will be. And this inevitably puts religion on a collision course with science because these are claims made on bad evidence. And we don't have to distinguish hard science and soft science here. I mean, the, the, the core of science is not mathematical modeling. It is intellectual honesty. It is, a, it is a willingness to have our certainties about the world constrained by good evidence and good argument. Now, so science might not encompass all intellectual endeavors, uh, as Lawrence pointed out, but intellectual honesty must. And the problem is, it, the problem is not that religious people are stupid. It's not, the problem is not that religious fundamentalists are stupid. I, mean, I happen to think you can be so well educated that you can build a nuclear bomb and still get, and still believe that you're going to get 72 virgins in paradise. That is the problem. The problem is that religion, because of it, it's been sheltered from criticism in the way that it has been, allows people, perfectly sane, perfectly intelligent people, to believe en masse what only idiots or lunatics could believe in isolation. I mean, if you wake up tomorrow morning convinced that saying a few Latin words over your breakfast cereal is literally going to turn it into the body of Julius Caesar or Elvis, you have lost your mind. <laughs> But, but if you believe that a cracker becomes the body of Jesus at the Mass, you, you're very likely perfectly sane. You just happen to be Catholic. But the, the beliefs really are equivalent, and they are equivalently crazy. So we do not respect stupidity in this country, but we systematically respect religious stupidity. And if, I think there's a basic truth about us that no double standard can can erase. Either a person is being intellectually honest or he isn't. Either a person is willing to look dispassionately at the data or he's trying to, to conform the data to his prior conception of the world. And science, when it is working, which is to say when it is really science, amounts to a systematic eschewal of dogma. I mean, dogma in science is humiliating whenever it's recognized to be dogma. Religion really requires the opposite commitment. I mean, consider a few recent statements by the Pope. He, he, he recently spoke to a, a college in Rome where he observed that there were two dangers facing the, the faithful at this moment in history. Uh, the first danger is of a secular society 
that denies God and thereby, quote, disorients and obfuscates the correct conscience of man. Now, there is an implicit claim being made here, although it's somewhat hard to make out. The claim is that human beings really do get their morality from religion. Religion, in this case, is Catholicism, obviously. Uh, and, in, and, and religion, in, in some sense, is the only source of real morality. Now, I'm quite uh, convinced that he is wrong about this, and one would have hoped that the, the legions of child rapists coming out of the priesthood would have given him some pause before making this claim. Uh, but I think it is the job of science and of intellectuals generally to really get to the bottom of what morality is, what it is neurologically, what, what, it, what it is demographically, the kinds of social structures that foster it. And I, I know we'll talk more about this. The Pope also warned against an approach to interfaith dialogue which, quote, weakens the essential content of the Christian faith in Christ as the lone savior of humanity and in the church as the necessary sacrament of salvation for all humanity. Now, there are several claims being made here. One is that faith in Christ is absolutely necessary for salvation. This, this makes one wonder just, just where, how far interfaith dialogue can go. Uh, but whatever we think of salvation as a concept, this kind of talk proves that the Pope and many millions of Catholics are fundamentally closed to any evidence or argument that suggests what is in fact likely to be true, that Jesus was an ordinary mortal, born of an ordinary act of procreation, and died like any animal. I mean, this, that, that fact, those facts, would be fundamentally corrosive to, to the belief system of Christians. So there, there were good reasons to believe that Jesus was born of a virgin or will be coming back to earth to, to judge the living and the dead. These beliefs would be part of our rational scientific description of the universe. These are claims about physics. These are claims about biology. The only reason why a person needs faith to accept these claims is because the evidence for them is remarkably thin. So I, I really think it is time we admitted that faith is really the permission that religious people give one another to, to believe things strongly when reasons fail. I think it's important to point out that there is no other area in our discourse where we consider this an acceptable practice. Now, there are, of course, many people who argue that there is no conflict between religion and science. How do they do this? Well, here, here's how the trick is done. Uh, first, they argue that, that science cannot prove that God does not exist. You know, atheism is a faith. Atheism, atheism is the faith that there is no God. Uh, can you prove that Jesus was not the Son of God? Can you prove that he did not rise from the dead on the third day? No. Now, I find it amazing how much, how much work these maneuvers actually do for people. I mean, it seems to me that Bertrand Russell, uh, I think as many of you know, closed the door to this kind of thinking for all time with his, his famous celestial teapot argument. I mean, can we prove that there's not a China teapot in elliptical orbit around the sun at this moment? No. Does it make it reasonable to believe in the existence of such a teapot? No. Is it reasonable to be agnostic about such a teapot? Not quite. <laughs> End of argument. I mean, the, the, it's obvious that the burden is not upon the atheist to prove the absence of celestial teapots. And the, and the real irony here, which I think we have to point out relentlessly, is that every religious person recognizes this with respect to the other guy's religion. I mean, every Christian knows exactly what it's like to be an atheist with respect to Islam. I mean, the Muslims think they have the, a book, the Quran, which is the perfect word of the creator of the universe. Why do they think so? Because it says so in the book. Not a good argument. Every Christian recognizes this with respect to Islam, but, th but they don't turn the same criticism upon their own discourse. 
I think we, we must oblige them to. Now there's a second trick that purports to reconcile religion and science. And it's one that, quite frankly, has taken in many scientists. The, the trick tends to surface whenever a specific piece of scientific data is being talked about and, try, and, and reconciled with, with uh, religion. In the, in the face of any scientific finding, there are two different questions you can ask. You can ask, does this datum suggest the existence of God? Or you can ask, is this compatible with the existence of God? And these are... They seem similar. They're, they have very different results. Let me take one fact that 99% of all the species that have ever lived on Earth are now extinct. Does this fact suggest that an omniscient and omnipotent and perfectly benevolent God has designed our world? Not at all. I mean, that's probably the last thing you would infer from such a fact. But ask the other question. Ask, is it is this this fact compatible with the existence of the biblical God? The answer to that question, of course, is yes, and it is always yes. You simply must add caveats like, who can understand the will of God? He may have wanted to destroy his creation uh, for some, some reason that surpasses our understanding. And of course, you can do this with hu human events. You, you look at the Holocaust. Would a reasonable person looking at the Holocaust at the fact that millions of people were herded into ghettos and terrorized and then murdered and reduced to ash by their neighbors, would you, would you look at that series of events and say, well, there's probably an omniscient and perfectly benevolent and all-powerful God taking an interest in human affairs? You wouldn't. But, but is it compatible with the biblical God? Of course. You simply must say God was very pissed off at the Jews or we have something called free will and God could not deny the Nazis such a golden opportunity to sin. Who can understand the will of God? As scientists, I think we have to observe that there is a profound difference between acquiring a picture of the world through dispassionate analysis of the facts and acquiring it through patent emotionality and wishful thinking and then only then looking to see if it can survive contact with the facts. Given the gaps in science and given the elasticity of religious thinking, it will always be possible to reconcile the most gratuitous nonsense with our modern scientific worldview. This is not the same thing as having scientific reasons to believe in God. So in conclusion, I just want to give you a sense of what is, is motivating these remarks and my participation here at the meeting. Because I, I'm afraid that we can lose everything we have. I, I don't just mean personally. I, I, I'm talking collectively. I think we can lose a civilization that functions most of the time by the rules of basic human sanity. I mean, you, you might think we haven't quite achieved that, but and maybe we, we haven't, not quite. But look at how so much of the world lives at this moment. Look at, look at the mayhem born in the name, largely in the name of, of what people believe about God. I mean, look, look at what life is like in Iraq and Afghanistan. So much of this world is consumed by violence, and so much of this violence is born of the religious fragmentation of the human community. I mean, the thing that I'm most worried about now is this religious fragmentation and the religious, fra the, the religious impediments to clear thinking. The, the, the religious willingness on the part of millions to rationalize the violent sacrifice of their own children by recourse to fairy tales. And religion allows this. So it just seems to me obvious that the, the history of our civilization is not yet written and there is no guarantee that the religious maniacs of the future will not be the ones to write it. Now, in a later session, I, I uh, plan to talk about ethics and how I view spiritual experience, because I think uh, that these are real domains of inquiry. It's not all just mumbo-jumbo. Uh, to say they're real domains of inquiry is to say that, that they can be explored very much in the spirit of science and without dogmatism. Uh, but briefly, I, I'll just say that the best in us does not require the worst in us. 
be our, our love of other human beings does not need to be nurtured by delusion. And yet we are hearing continuously from every corner of our culture that delusion is all we have. Delusion deserves our respect. Delusion is holy. It's not true. Thank you very much. I have a suspicion that Lawrence Krauss might have something to say about that. Well, I, you know, obviously I agree with much of what you said. It's hard not to, but, but I think the, um, and I, I, and I, I'm at least as much as concerned. I, I, in this political season, have been waste, spending a lot of my time trying to actually affect elections in my own state of Ohio uh, to, and by recruiting candidates who believe in science. As a, as a useful activity. Um, but it, to take the wonderful example uh, uh, from Bertrand Russell, um, surely it would, be, it, it would be a waste of... The teapot around the sun is an interesting example because it, it, it's not worth even talking about, right? Mm. I mean, it would be, surely be an incredible waste of scientists' time to spend a lot of their time trying to explain why there wasn't a teapot around the sun. Instead, it would be a remarkably more productive thing um, to explain exactly how you can predict the motion of the planets around the sun using uh, this law of gravity, and that maybe you can understand the future of the universe and the past and, and the incredible things you can learn about it. And so um, the, the, one, the, the way I'd frame this is that perhaps the best, ex if you believe that, the, that a rational world is a better world, and I do, and I know you do, that, that, to me, the, one of the best ways to do that is to demonstrate rationality rather than attacking irrationality. Uh, it, it's, it's important at times to do it, and I've done it. Uh, but I think it's much more fruitful in the end to, to, to lead by example. That's the argument I think I, I want to stress. Uh, yes. Yeah. That's that teapot around the sun again. Now. Well, I'm, I'm not going to defend uh, religion from Sam Harris. But um, I, I did want to say a, little, a word about American religion. I'm a little bit more sanguine about it than you are. Um, I live in Texas. I, I have many friends who belong to denominations uh, that officially teach all sorts of things that I find absurd or abhorrent. But when you really talk to them, uh, which is not so often, about what they really think, you find their opinions are much more woolly. And that it may be that 53% or whatever the percent is, when asked in a poll, will say they believe this, that, or the other thing. But when you really get to talk to them, you find their beliefs are not so certain. Uh, in particular, uh, many of them believe that uh, those who, um, excuse me, many of them belong to religions that officially teach that those who do not accept Christ are doomed to an eternity of torment in hell. And yet I find that they don't try to convert me. I mean, they don't make any attempt to convince me that I'm going to be burned in hell for eternity if I don't join their church. And of course, one possible theory is that they don't mind if I spend eternity in hell. I want you to. But, you know, I'm inclined to think, and, and I find this in talking to them, uh, on the occasions when I can talk to them more seriously, that they're not that certain about it. Uh, but I wouldn't be say that I'm sanguine about the world of Islam. And the obvious difference is um, performance. You know, uh, Larry and I and Sam can talk about these things, and we'll even, if the, anyone ever watches this program, um, uh, be out there, and Amer America, Christian Americans will will hear us saying these things, and I don't really feel that anyone's going to come after us to cut off our heads. But in the Islamic world, and even in Europe, where there are now a very large number of Muslims, you can't be that uh, secure. I mean, Theo van Gogh was murdered for saying unpleasant things about Islam. And, um, uh, you know, we've, se we've seen so many examples of this. So I think you know, I don't have much respect for religion, but I think it's important to disrespect, not to necessarily disrespect them all equally. Um, yeah. Uh, and 
In fact, I think this business of respect for religion, and, and here I'm really just seconding uh, Sam Harris, really is dangerous. I think that it, not only with regard to truth, matters of fact that Sam Harris talked about, but with matters of morality, that the fact that people take their morality from their religion should not necessarily entitle it to respect on our part if on the basis of our best feelings it is in fact immoral. Sam, did you, did you have a... Him? Sure, because sure. I have one thing I want to say. Um, yeah, there, there are many things. I, the, first, let me pick up on, on what uh, Stephen just said. Clearly, we have to distinguish between specific religious ideologies. I mean, my argument is that specifically what people believe really matters. I mean, it really matters that in Islam at this moment, the doctrines of martyrdom and jihad are highly operative and, and give a rationale for, for the kind of behavior, you know, the kind of death cult we see brewing in the Muslim world. And it's not an accident, given the, the theology of Islam, that that's happening. It, it is harder to get that kind of behavior off the ground if you're a Buddhist or even if you're a Christian at this moment in Christian history, given actually speci specific differences in, in ideology. Uh, so yeah, I don't think we, we, we have to recognize that religion is a word like sport or a word like drug. I mean, there are many different kinds of sports. There are many different kinds of drugs. They don't have that necessarily that much in common. And we will, under no circumstances, have a problem with Jane suicide bombers no matter how we mistreat the Jains. I mean, the, the Jain religion really is a religion of nonviolence. And the more, the more deranged you get as a Jain, you become less and less violent. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and there, you know, there, could, there are liabilities. The, the problem with dogmatism, really, uh, I see, is that you almost can never tell how bad its consequences are going to be. I mean, it, because it, it's, not, it's not mapping onto, I mean, dogmas are these beliefs about the world that are not respondent to their consequences in the world and to the, the streams of evidence and argument that should be modifying them. So you have a dogma like, like uh, contraception use is immoral, this, this classically Catholic idea. This seems potentially benign. I mean, it seems like you know, at the, in the worst case, you're going to get overpopulation. But then you map that onto sub-Saharan Africa, where you have Catholic ministers preaching the sinfulness of condom use in regions of the world where AIDS is epidemic to people who have no other information about condom use but the representation of the ministry. And so what I've argued elsewhere, this is, this is genocidally stupid, this behavior. Uh, and yet because, as Stephen points out, because it is coming under the aegis of a person's religious conviction, it is immune to the kind of criticism that we would, we would normally marshal against it. And, and the one other thing I'd like to say, I think, in, in that the Dan Dennett would say if he were here, is that, yes, there probably is some distance between what people actually believe and what they profess to believe. I mean, you know, we have these astonishing poll results, and then we have to ask ourselves, well, how many people are really sure that Satan exists and leads people to sin, as something like 70 percent of the American population claims to believe? Uh, I just think you have to, you know, you cut, cut the, the poll number in half or in a third. I mean, there's some core people who are really sure. And in the Muslim world, this, there's absolutely no possibility of doubting this because they simply blow themselves up in, in front of the offices of the UN or the Red Cross to announce their certainty. And this is, this is so I think the idea that, that no one's sure, I think, is... is I just want to say one thing. I know you want to move on, but, but, but it relates to the two things that have just been said. The willingness that Steve talked about, which is certainly real, I, I think reflects a, a more general willingness that's based on, on illiteracy, in particular literacy of uh, scientific literacy. There's another poll number that e is m equally, maybe more disturbing to me than the ones about evolution. And that, and that comes from National Science Foundation studies that are done each year of scientific literacy. And every single year since it's been done, the 50 percent of the American public get the answer to this question wrong. Does the Earth orbit the sun and take a year to do it? Okay, 50 percent of the American public don't believe the Earth orbits the sun and takes a year to do it, at least in the survey. Every single year. Now, I know who they voted for, but that's a different issue. Um, the, the, the point is that the will, I'm not sure if you really confronted them about this, that, that they'd, they'd really believe the, that the Earth, that the sun went around the Earth. But that wooliness, that really fundamental misunderstanding about nature, that ignorance is what, to me, allows 
a lot of the dogma to result. And so it, it, it seems to me that what we, the real villain here is, is it ultimately is ignorance. And the best way to overcome ignorance is to, is, is, is to teach. And, 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 to, and, and that when you have a more literate and particularly scientifically literate public, I happen to believe that, uh, that, uh, that uh, it will be much more difficult for a lot of the things that you fear and I fear to happen. Right. Well, I agree. Let me just say, however, that I'm not – the basis for being totally sanguine on that front is uh, rather narrow when you notice people like Francis Collins. I mean, how much more science does Francis Collins need to have on board before he doubts – that Jesus is the Son of God likely to return to save humanity. I mean, this is, you know, as many of you, I think, know, he's written this book, The Language of God. It purports to reconcile evangelical Christianity with the last 50 years of molecular biology. When you get to the point in the book where he had his doubts about Jesus removed, you come upon a passage, not I mean, the, the anthropic principle and other things are in there, but when you get to the, the nuts and bolts of why he's sure of Jesus, you get to a moment where he was hiking in the Cascade Mountains and came upon a frozen waterfall. It was beautiful. He fell to his knees in the dewy, gr in the dewy grass and gave himself to Christ. Uh, now, I would argue that if a frozen waterfall can testify to the, the truth of, of Christian doctrine, it can testify to anything. Uh, and this is not scientific thinking. And it, it gets a pass. I mean, it, it is impolitic for me to perhaps be even be saying this uh, and I would you know I would love to say I would love to be in dialogue with Francis directly about this but it, it is this kind of thinking comes at a great price in our society because it is uh, it is now imagined that you can be rigorously scientific on every question and be certain based on a frozen waterfall that that Jesus is, is the, the sole savior of humanity and I, I think that that's uh, quite dangerous when we have a president who uses his first veto to block stem cell research, for instance. Yeah, a couple of points there, Sam. Uh, one is that Francis Collins actually was invited. They invited him twice, and he's got an intramural meeting that he's actually chairing. So he, he sent his apologies. He would have liked to have been here. There was, obviously, there was a debate at Time Magazine's offices between uh, Richard Dawkins and Francis Collins, um, which I believe is the subject of uh, the next, next Monday's Time Magazine, Richard I guess we'll be able to tell us about it when he gets here. Secondly, Dan Dennett, those of you who didn't know, had um, a serious um, heart issue a couple of weeks ago. He's fine now. He's back at writing vibrant and wonderful articles, one of which will be read by Paul Church and later on. And Dan sends his best wishes as well. Uh, a lot of people, in fact, who were invited will be coming to, uh, I hope will be coming to the, the one that they are missing. Um, but we did invite Ed Wilson, and he said that he would um, love to come, but he was trying to reduce his schedule from insane to merely frantic. Um, so he can't be with us either, but again, sends his best wishes. How are you doing? So um, I suspect there may be some questions from the uh, people at the table, let, some responses. Let, what, it's hard to know how to respond to Neil ever, but uh, <laughs> um, uh, yeah. I, you know, the question that you asked about why 15% is, is, is disturbs me a little bit because this, this other presumption that that uh, you know scientists are somehow not people, and and that they don't have the same delusions and you know they're how many of them are pedophiles in the National Academy of Sciences? I don't know how many of them are Republicans. Uh, you know, uh, 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 um, uh, and so um, it would be amazing, of course, if if it, if it were zero. That would be the that would be the news story. Uh, it's, and but the point is, I don't think you'll expect. Uh, uh, any of them, in, well, in general, to be to, to have their religion, for them to view their religion as a bulwark against science, or to view the need to fly into buildings or whatever, whatever the point is. So there, are, I, I, the delusions or the predilections of individual scientists are important to recognize. That scientists are people, and 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 they're full. It's full of delusions about every aspect of their life. As everyone else, we all make up inventions so we can rationalize our existence and, our, and why we are who we are. But Lawrence, if you can't convert our colleagues, why do you have any hope you're going to convert the public? I, I don't think we have to convert those people. They're fine. They're, that's the point. They're doing science. They're, they're no problem. That's why, why Bob, I don't understand why you need to do that. The, the figure is actually, I believe it's 7%, 7%. not 15%. Yeah. Okay, yeah. 
it's, it's even worse. <laughs> in terms, but it, but it's in, in a way, it's sort of ir irrelevant, like you said, how many of them are also c conservative or liberal. It, the, from a social scientist's point of view, it's just what are the different variables that go into somebody's belief system? Um, so at the end of my book, Why People Believe Weird Things, uh, the last chapter is called Why Smart People Believe Weird Things, which is the, the harder question to answer. And the short answer to that is because they're better at rationalizing beliefs they arrived at for non-smart reasons, which is to say most of the beliefs that most of us hold, you arrive at because you were raised that way or you were influenced by peers or mentors or, um, or there, there's some psychological comfort to it or whatever. And, but because we live in the age of science, you're supposed to justify your beliefs. So you, you using the after the fact reasoning, you go back and look for reasons to justify it and smart people are just better at that. And, and, and not just in religion, they're better at rationalizing why they're conservatives or liberals or whatever economic ideologies they support or whatever across the board. And, uh, but, but really, the, the, from a social scientist's point of view, there's obviously a relationship between education and intelligence and religiosity. It goes down. It does. It absolutely goes down as education goes up. There's a reverse correlation. It's undeniable in study after study. And, um, and, and it's just one of many variables that you would, you would look at like that. So there's obviously something going on there that's meaningful. Mm. Uh, can I interject quickly that what we don't often see is the effect of your education level subtracted out of the effect of having of being a scientist in your likelihood of being religious? So, in other words, we say what's we we say this forty percent figure for the nation's scientists, but we don't. And all scientists in that study have PhDs. So we have to ask what percentage of PhDs in any field are religious. That number is less than the figure for the general public. And so you're already sort of halfway there just by having the PhD in any field. And now you ask, what effect does being a scientist have on it? And it's a smaller effect than we're otherwise mm -hmm. giving it, granting it, if you don't otherwise cite the, 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 mm -hmm. the simply uh, the, the, the being educated effect. I think it was the engineers were the, of the scientists were the most likely to believe, wasn't it? Sam? Yeah, and the mathematicians and, and were high up. biologists too. were the least likely yeah. to believe, yeah. yeah. Uh, another thing that was interesting in that poll was that, that physicians uh, were more likely than scientists. Sixty percent of U.S. physicians believe in a personal God. And I think that probably shouldn't be surprising simply because physicians are the people who have to tell people all day long that they're going to die. Uh, or they tell the family that, they, that, that, you know, that their uh, family member is going to die. And I think death is very much central to this uh, this what is otherwise a quite a, an astonishing feature of our discourse that so many people believe the preposterous. I mean, there is no there is no story that is going to so totally inure you to the the tragedy of the death of your own child um, uh, better than the story that she has been taken up to be with Jesus again, and you you're going to you're going to see her in a few short years, um, and so r these religious myths are are paying enormous dividends, emo emotional dividends for people. And I think it is the job of science to uh, present a fully positive account of ha just how we can be happy and in this world and reconciled to our circumstance. One which, uh, you know, the, the alternative that religion is, is essentially offering people in that situation is uh, the alternative to learning how to grieve. I mean, rather than learn how to grieve as children, uh, we learn how to uh, believe that death is, doesn't exist, um, or is in, in some cases a good thing, the best thing that could possibly happen to you as you get in this, this cult of martyrdom. Um, but what, one thing I think we should call attention to here is, is, is something that Michael brought up in his talk, is that there is a, there's a difference between, in a context like this, calling a spade a spade and really calling delusion delusion, and doing it across the board in every social situation where you become this boorish character who, you know, you get into an elevator and you see someone with a cross around her neck and you <laughs> lurch to toward her and try to take away Jesus in that moment. Um, this is not something that anyone, I think, is advocating. I'm, I'm, not, I'm probably one of the more strident people here, um, and I'm not advocating that. But I think that even here we are suffering the, the, the taboos that, that I'm trying to call attention to, and I know Richard uh, quite eloquently and for many years has been calling attention to, um, the taboo around criticizing these esteemed religious myths. Uh, we can laugh at a belief in Zeus, but we can't laugh at a belief in Allah or the biblical God, even here. And I just, I just want to um, 
point out that I mean our, our situation is so uncanny. I mean, we we have a world that has been shattered by literature, and I think we have to marshal an an emotional response that would the same response we would have if we woke up in a world tomorrow where, you know, the, the all the violence in the Middle East, all the bloodletting, all the wars, and 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 threat of future war was born of rival interpretations of the plays of Shakespeare, where you know the, the Jews like King Lear and the Muslims like Hamlet and they're willing to blow themselves up in crowds of children <laughs> over the difference. Okay, that, that seems like an impossibly bizarre world to live in, and yet that is exactly the world we are living in. And I I if, we could, if we could come face to face with that strangeness, uh, I think we wouldn't be wasting much time wondering about whether there is a conflict between religion and science. Um, one thing I'd like to do at this point, is, uh, well, the, 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 the idea at this point is um, uh, I would like to actually get some audience comments because I think we've gone on long enough. I think I see a lot of people looking there agitated wanting to say something. So we could just take a few audience comments and then um, we'll have Steven Weinberg lead us into lunch moving on to the if not God then what section. Just a brief thing to think about over lunch and then after lunch we'll come back with Joan, with Carolyn Porco and a couple of others to go and discuss those issues. But I, I think it'd be a good idea to get some, get some interaction from you all because I think you've been sitting there wanting to say things for quite a while. So, Mazarin. Um, so it seems to me that, you know, you and we agree on what the problem is, but there seem to be... yourselves? Pardon me. Oh, I'm Mazarin Banaji uh, from the Department of Psychology at Harvard. Um, you, 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 you know, you, you all agree uh, on so many basic assumptions. Uh, where the differences lie, it seems to me, is in how we ought to treat those who think so differently from us. And so my question to you is, uh, given that there have been uh, ways in which propaganda machines have been set up in the past to convert large groups of people, and we've known how to do that effectively in certain parts of of, of, of uh, the world and not as well in others. Uh, is there something about the scientific agenda that sort of handicaps us in a particular way? In other words, if the Warren Buffett, uh, Bill Gates uh, Foundation were to give you the 30 billion that is now only half their endowment, what would you want to do with it uh, to bring about change in the manner in which you see it appropriate? Let, let me give you one quick answer. I mean, I spend a lot of time in the public arena now, uh, and, one of the, and scientists are particularly poor handicapped uh, because um, you don't deal with lies very easily. Uh, Randy, did a, the amazing Randy did a wonderful example of, you know, he, he had two assistants who, who uh, he got to go into a, a, um, a um, uh, ESP testing laboratory and he said, you know, fool them. And uh, if anyone ever asks you if you're cheating, say, yeah, I'm cheating, I'm cheating. And of course, the, the study came up with two wonderful ca examples of people at ESP. And, and the reason the scientists never, you, you presume that there's an honest discussion. And in the, in the, in the public domain, in the, in the domain of, of public relations and politics, uh, which is what a lot of this is involved with, vitally, um, you can't just assume that the truth is going to win out. It, it, you can't just assume, you know, when I pick up a physics journal, I, physics physical review, I say, that's garbage, that's garbage, that's garbage. And a lot of it's garbage, but I don't spend my time writing articles saying it's garbage because I know it's going to fall by the wayside. But in the public domain, a lot of the garbage isn't going to fall by the wayside. You have to actively create a public relations campaign. You have to look, think about sound bites, and you have to become an evangelist. And that's very difficult, I think, for much of the scientific community to do. It's, it's not in their nature. And so I think um, it, it, it is there are inherent handicaps to combating certain well-funded groups whose, whose existence is based on, on public relations and manipulating the truth. Well, if I had half the 30 billion, I would call the United States every week from my island and, and check in with the Skeptic <laughs> Society and see how they're doing there. And uh, uh, although it's true, uh, Neil, we can't talk people out of their religious beliefs, I any more than we can talk them out of being conservative or liberal or, or, or any belief system they're behaviorally committed to. But we can offer something else and let them come to it in their own good time. I, I thought of an analogy of this just a couple of days ago in the, uh, I think it was in the LA Times calendar section or the, one of the variety uh, movie papers. They were running ads for all the uh, awards for the upcoming film festivals. And, and every one of them at the top says, for your consideration. And then, then there's the, the ad for the film and all the good things about the film. So in a way, 
uh, all the books that we write and uh, articles and so on, in, in a way it's saying, for your consideration, here, think about this. Uh, Richard's idea of consciousness raising, um, it, it's not that uh, uh, we're going to convert people, but here's an alternative. Try, try it on. Uh, sometimes I'll say, just try being an atheist for, you know, an hour and see how it goes. And, and you can always, you know, back off or try it for a day or something like that and just see, just see it, how it goes. Uh, you can't force force it to happen, but it, it can happen if if there's something available. So our job is just to make it available, something appealing. There's one question here from Patricia Church, and who's chair of philosophy at UCSD. Hi, I'm, I wanted to follow up Marja Banerjee's point because I, I think that that you're not being imaginative enough in your response. Um, Marja's suggestion is not that you get the scientists to actually do this PR campaign, but that you hire a PR firm and you say, look, what we want to do <clears throat> is make available to the public the kind of story that Neil told. And do it in a way that's persuasive. You guys are the ones who are supposed to be in the business of, of persuading people. Get the sound bites right, get the timing right, hit the right television shows. Bill Gates has provided $30 million to do this. We'll get, start you on $10 million. Let's go. But I don't think that what you really want to do is get the scientists to sort of timidly come out and say, well, you know, you really want to think about how the... Blah, blah, blah. That, that, we're not that great at it most of us. So give the job to people who know how to do it. I mean, if it re give it to professionals. Thank you. Uh, I mean, if, it, if it's an economic matter, and I think that was the br one of the brilliant parts of Neil's talk, if it's an economic matter, I mean, there's a lot of people who care about the economic future of this country. So if it's an economic matter, get the PR company onto it. Uh, what? As my wife often reminds me, I, 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 most people don't give a hoot. I, 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 science, I mean, I think it's nice if someone gave us $30 billion, but I don't think, I think, it, well, you, TV stations march with their feet. I, I, I and other people like to try and do, get things, science on, on TV and, and other things. And the reason they're not on the, the reason, hold on a second, they're not on ABC and NBC and CBS is for the most part people figure there's not a lot of money to be made because and it would be nice to try and convince them otherwise but for the moment I think it's very difficult um, to try and get a lot of money on PR on science because it's not perceived by those people who are willing to spend the money as being a way to make money Sorry, I, I, I don't mean to be tedious so but but if I may just follow that up Neil's point was that having a culture of ignorance as opposed to a culture of discovery is in the long run bad for economics. That's the point. Mm -hmm. And I think if that point can be got across in a way that's appealing, um, I, so, so I'm not necessarily talking about getting people to be more scientifically literate. I'm talking about getting them to see that science is in their yeah, economic interests. Yeah, I mean, I spoke interest. at the American Enterprise Institute, which is as conservative as it gets, because they recognize that this is indeed bad for, bad for the economy. But, but, um, but I think there are large-scale reasons why they don't particularly care if there's a large number of uneducated people. Um, I, I actually think that the presence of certain people in this room shows that people, some scientists and philosophers are actually pretty good communicators. So um, I'm delighted to have a chance to introduce Scott Atran. You had a question? Uh, Scott Atron from the National Center for Scientific Research in Paris. Um, there seems to be a conflation of two problems. The first is keeping non-scientific thoughts, irrational thoughts, out of science. Noble enterprise. The second is introducing science as a rational way of doing ethics and politics. Is there the slightest historical evidence whatsoever that the involvement of science in politics or ethics has done anything or could do anything to improve the human condition. I don't and think I anyone here has suggested that. Uh, I, your remark seems irrelevant to what's been said. There's no suggestion that... We, no one has suggested that science provides a way of, of being more ethical or... or that it engages in politics, it tells suicide bombers, for example, that they're... Well, it may remove motivations for bad behavior, 
but it itself doesn't provide a moral, I mean, science doesn't provide a moral uh, uh, standard. It, it uh, has nothing to do with that. It may provide a way of uh, puncturing other uh, vicious moral standards. Well, except as a subset of enlightenment values of reason, of which science is a part, certainly there in the Jeffersonian sense, of course we want to apply reason to political decisions, uh, absolutely. So I, th I think there it's relevant. I don't think you, you shouldn't construe science narrowly in the sense because I mean, the way I look at it is we, when the stakes are high, we have a choice between conversation and violence. I mean, we have both interpersonally and at the level of nations, we have a choice between conversation and, or, and war, essentially. And what I see religious faith doing, what dogma does intrinsically, and, and, and religious dogma especially, is it stops the conversation. I mean, dogma, it, it, dogma are those beliefs that you have taken off the table, that are no longer uh, there to be revised through, through new evidence and new argument. And these are the dogmas, these are the beliefs around which people are, are making their, their strongest claims about us, them, in-group, out-group, sort of tribalism. Um, and so I think the, the only thing that guarantees that our collaboration with one another is truly open-ended is a willingness to have our beliefs about the world and our behavior revised through conversation. And that is, that is science broadly construed. So you are advocating the introduction of reason and argument into, uh, human, into, into helping along human interactions into a more compassionate. Well, I think they started that several yeah, hundred years ago. That was the whole point of the Enlightenment. Yes. So hey, but wouldn't your own research, Scott, uh, on the psychology of terrorists, how to build a terrorist, yes. wouldn't that be applying science to understanding something that ultimately has political implications? Yes, of course. But I'm just questioning the fact whether science should get involved in the, in the processes of political um, motivations and happenings. Okay, can I just address that briefly? Um, I had the, the honor of giving a tour of our new facility in New York, it was new six years ago, to um, Richard Holbrook, who was the, uh, shortly had finished his tour of duty as American ambassador to the United Nations. And he was a neighbor, so we, we did this for him. And I'm giving him, I'm showing him the moon and the planets and the stars and, you know, and he starts asking questions. And he says, well, is, uh, how much more is the effect of the moon being closer now that I just learned that it's an elliptical orbit on the tides? I said, oh, good point. There's a strong distance dependence on tide. And we, go, we start going around. And the stars, the, some are red. It must be a temperature thing going on there. Yeah, some are cool. And he starts asking these questions. And I'm saying, well, this guy just, just came out of the Balkans in, in conversations with the unrest over there. And he's asking me informed questions about the cosmos. And so I said to him, where does this come from? This is not just, where did this come from? And he said, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't tell you. Actually, in college, I majored in physics. <laughs> Okay, and he switched his major like the last year or something. But he had his, this inculcation in sort of rational scientific thought that goes on in any physics curriculum. And I said, well, how, then I asked your question. And I said, has this worked in any one way or another, positively or negatively, in your negotiations, in your peace talks? And he said, I cannot imagine having accomplished what I did without that kind of thinking. Because, of course, in physics, you distill a problem to the, 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 its essence, find out that you shed what you don't need, look at what matters, and you discuss what matters. And when other people come in with their baggage, he cuts right through it and is able to, able to reach consensus in ways that others can't or can't even imagine. And so getting back to Steve's point, it's not so much that a law of physics gets invoked to solve an international problem, but certainly the training that goes on in the, in the mind of a scientist has got to be useful in solving problems, even interpersonal problems, more useful than not having that kind of background, well, uh, as, as evidenced by at least this one. I agree with what case. you said, except for the last thing, interpersonal problems. I, I, uh, no, and not in a facetious way either. Uh, um, you know, I agree with you completely. I, I think what we should really need to teach is process of science, is how, and, and that's what we try and do. And you know, certainly, as I'm as chair of the physics department. That's what we try and do, but. But I'm a little worried about this notion that people are intrinsically rational. I don't think people are, are, are intrinsically rational. I mean, you, there's a rational component to humans, but I think we depend on our, most of us on our irrationality to get through every day. 
Uh, and maybe, you know, to be happy, you have to be delusional. I don't know. Maybe it will, science will discover that. If we discover that in order to be happy, you have to be delusional at some point in your life, are we going to say you shouldn't be delusional? I don't know. I, I think that the notion that, that rationality is, um, is, is the central and major part of hum, human life is, is, is not at all clear when I look Nobody around the world. Nobody said it's that. We're just we, saying it's, it's, our it's job essential to, to solving a debate. It's, it's, well, it's, it's very useful, and I think it's essential. I think it's an essential component, and it's our job to encourage it. But, but, uh, but I think we are fooling ourselves to think that, that um, we'll ever live in a world that's completely rational. Yeah, I'm not saying that. I think, there's, I think I, we should address this point because uh, there's a yawning chasm of uh, uh, nihilism waiting us if we don't uh, 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 seal it up. It, the, the idea that there's this opposition <laughs> to, 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 to speak rationally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Why are we here? Chasm of yeah. nihilism. There's a, there are many, many uh, justifications for uh, madness have been uh, uh, coming out of that hole. The, this opposition between reason and everything else, I think, is fundamentally spurious. I think this, this idea that there's love on the one hand and then the cool rationality of science that's just all clatter and clockwork and soulless, this, this is a false dichotomy. And it's a, it's a dichotomy that is pervasive mm -hmm. in the culture. I, you know, you can't sci you know, I can't tell you how many times I get on, on the radio and someone says, scientifically prove to me that you love your wife. Mm -hmm as though that were just the knockdown argument of all time against, you know, against reason and in support of faith. Um, there's nothing irrational in principle about love. I mean, it, it is rational to value love. It is rational to try to, ma to, to recognize that it is one of our uh, uh, most cherished experiences and, and then to try to, to, to live a life that maximizes it. Understanding love at the level of the brain is not going to deflate its, its importance for us. I um, mean, the fact that we, we can understand the molecular constituents of chocolate doesn't make us not want to eat chocolate. I mean, these are different scales of, of interaction with the world. And um, so it's not a matter of only being coldly calculating in, in our approach to life. But uh, where we have to call a spade a spade is in gratuitous claims to certainty about invisible realities and the moral structures to the universe, about a God who so hates homosexuality that he will whip up tsunamis uh, in defense of, of chaste heterosexual people. I mean, this is, this is a, a, a vision of life that is animating millions and millions of our neighbors, and we have been cowed into not criticizing it. And I mean, to pick up what Pat Churchland said, this job is not best done by scientists. This is the, we need from from a hundred sides, culture at large, to to just make it fundamentally embarrassing to hold these kinds of certainties. And I don't know if you you know about how the, the KKK how its stature got so eroded in this in this country. But there's this this great little story about uh, this guy Stetson Kennedy who leaked. He, he joined the KKK, and then he leaked all their goofy lingo and secret passwords to the people who were writing the Adventures of Su Superman radio series back in the 40s. And so every week, uh, it was Superman fighting the KKK with all the up-to-the-minute passwords and handshakes and, you know, bogus, cultish nonsense. And uh, so the, the, 